Oh my goodness, you girls are so sweet. I love Marilee and Audrey, and they have just been such a joy. I'll tell you, Joshua Springs, ladies, this is like the mothership for us. Um, us little Calvary Chapel Sweet Hills, we bring our vessels, we park here, and we get filled. So thank you so much. I know Calvary Chapel Amani's here too. So blessed you girls are here. And truly, I grew up under Chuck Smith, like Michelle. She's my big sister in the faith. And I remember going to stuff like this and really like my foundation being built. So for all of you that put in all the time and sacrifice, thank you so much. It's, it's such a blessing. And my girls here that are here, um, they're getting to receive and they're getting to get filled up. So thank you again. Let's pray before I go on my little rabbit trails. Lord, we just come before you and we're so thankful for your house, Lord, this place that we can gather together. And there is a special blessing when we gather together as your people. There, no doubt, is a special word for each and every one of us here. Maybe one word, two word, three words, so much, Lord, for you to say. And so we want to ask you, Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say this morning or this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to share a little bit about myself. Marilee asked me to um, share about our purpose in the workplace. How many of you girls here are working moms or working ladies? Okay, we've got a good representation. How many of you have husbands? Okay, there we go. That's a, that's a job right there. How many of you have kids? Okay, you're all working women. This is going to apply to you. Praise you, Jesus. Um, we have agency as women. And I believe women play a vital role in the flourishing of the body of Christ in God's community. We have fiercely defended those without voices in history. We have creatively solved problems. And women play a vital role in advancing the kingdom of God. Would you guys, would you guys agree with me? We are, we are in the trenches for his kingdom. And so as I was praying about this message, um, thank you, Michelle, she set me up. The message is going to be titled, Purpose Under Pressure. Purpose Under Pressure. My husband and I, before we entered the ministry, he wasn't a pastor. I like to joke around and say that he tricked me. Um, I, was, uh, I met him at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, and then he was later ordained as an assistant pastor. And at the time, we were on a missions trip to Mexico with Pastor Jerry and Peggy Brown with U-Turn for Christ. And on one of those days, they had a need for an interpreter. And they said, hey, you speak Spanish, come help us in the medical tent. So I was in that medical tent all day. And one of the doctors was like, hey, you're pretty good at this. You should really look into the interpreting field. It's, it pays really well. And at the time I was studying linguistics and I thought, you know, this pays better than what I was looking into. So how the Lord uses when we're serving him sometimes to direct our ways in different ways. So I started looking into that. I, I graduated with my degree in linguistics. I went into the interpreting field and I absolutely loved it. I did time um, working trials in downtown LA, working civil trials, um, working international law trials, doing voiceovers. And it was that season of excitement and, and loving my profession. Um, but then my husband entered the ministry full time. <laughs> Um, we started a home Bible study. Uh, my husband was just, let's go knock on doors. He just said, let's go knock on doors. Let's invite people over to our house. So we started this home Bible study and it started busting at the seams. We moved from one house to another. And our pastor told us at the time, yeah, I'm going to give you guys the boot. You should really pray about starting a church out in the area. And we started a church plant. I was so naive at church building. I thought, oh yes, let's do it. <laughs> There's nothing to this. We can do this. And so we started Calvary Chapel Sweet Hills in Banning in the past area. And that season was very different for me. It came with driving long distances, commuting, coming back home, taking my heels off, putting flats on, grabbing my guitar because I was going to lead worship to, oh shoot, somebody called off of children's ministry. Let me run into the children's ministry room and help with the children's ministry. And then I gotta wake up at 5 a.m. because I gotta be on that 10 freeway to make it down to Hill Street because there's a criminal trial. And on my way, I'd be driving and I'd get a call. Oh yeah, it's that one sister. She's gonna leave her husband again for the 50th time. Lord, I have no inspiration right now. 
come over me, anoint me. And those were difficult seasons of pressure, right? You're doing two things. You're working, you're a wife. At the time I was a wife, I didn't have kids. I, we were starting a church plant and coming from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, oh my gosh, I was so blessed under that huge canopy of anointing, of gifting, of provision. And I thought, well, where's the bass players? Where's that mother's room? <laughs> Where's the full staff that we can send people off to get counseling? No, that was us. And I thought, man, Lord, this is harder than I thought. And then came children. We all know what a surprise and a joy they are, but the challenge it could be. And I think I shared about this the other time I was here speaking, you know, rushing from work to pick up the kids, to get them to midweek study, to come home super late at night and do it all over again. And we can get tired and the pressure can be real, amen? Every season has its theme. So we have seasons of we're passionate, we're energized. And then there's other seasons in our life that we're exhausted, right? And some seasons where we feel overwhelmed and maybe you never intended to work. Maybe you've been propelled into the workforce because of financial strain and you find yourself tired and Let's face it, we live in California. Dual incomes are a real thing, right? And so as I started thinking about what we all face as women, I started to think, you know, that word pressure really describes it well. No matter where we're at, there's some sort of pressure that we're facing. I happen to be in 1 Samuel 27, so let's turn there this, even, this afternoon. Man, I can't figure it out. Morning, evening, <laughs> it's afternoon. 1 Samuel 27, let's turn there. So our hero in the faith, King David, found himself in a situation where he was struggling with pressure. David had recently been anointed king, but he was off in caves fighting from one cave to the other. He was, still wasn't on the throne. He was having to face Saul time after time. And so that's where our story lands us. It says in verse one, then David said in his heart, now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair or he'll stop searching for me anymore in the territory of Israel and I will escape from his hand. So David arose and crossed over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath, the Philistine king. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each of his household, even David, with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's, Nabal's widow. Now it was told Saul that David had fled, fled to Gath, so he no longer searched for him. Then David said to King Achish, if now I have found favor in your sight, let them give me a place in one of the cities in your country that I may live there. For why should your servants live in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah till this day. And the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was, was a year and four months. Isn't that interesting that the Lord actually numbers how long David spent in the enemy's camp? Our God is so intentional. He sees every one of our wanderings. And it says in verse 8, Now David and his men went up and raided the Gershuites and the Gerzites, I'm so bad at pronouncing, and the Amalekites. For they were the inhabitants of the land from ancient times, as you come to sure, even as far as the land of Egypt. And David attacked the land and did not leave a man or woman alive. And he took away the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels, and the clothing. Then he returned and came to Achish. Now Achish said, where have you made a raid today? And David said, against the Negev of Judah and against the Negev of Jeremelites and against the Negev of the Kenites. And David did not leave a man or woman alive 
to bring to Gath, saying, lest they should tell us about, they should tell about us, saying, so David has done, and so has been his practice all the time he has lived in the country of the Philistines. Oh my gosh, what is David doing? He, now he's killing everybody so that they don't report what's really happening. And it says in verse 12, so Achish believed David, saying, he has surely made himself odious among his people Israel. Therefore, he will become my servant forever. What is happening in this chapter? Oh my gosh. There's lies. There's compromise. This is so not like who we would think David to be, right? And I always think of, as I was in this chapter, I always think of, we always think of David and Bathsheba. And that, that's such a big, huge thing that we think of David's faltering. But actually, before he even became king, he had a trial. It was a pretty big one. It's interesting that his discouragement really happened under the pressure he was facing. And can you blame him? I mean, if we really come to think about this, do you girls remember the infamous mighty men that follow David? The, the famous mighty men, they were brave, they were courageous. And I always picture them with like this camel haired skin and like, like a gypsy bandana riding on a like stallion and they're all coming out from the desert. I had never realized, it says here in our text, that they came with families. So King David is having to provide and lead 600 men and their families, not just men, their families. He has to lead them. He has to help feed them. He has to protect them. And then on top of that, he has Saul, who never takes a break from fighting him every single day. It says here that Saul pursued him every day, every day. The pressure was relentless, ladies. And as I was writing down these words, I started to think, hey, this kind of sounds like committed Christians in California. <laughs> we have the challenge of feeding our families under the skyrocketing inflation happening right now under our governor. We've got laws being passed like AB 1955, where they're trying to take our children from us, where they're trying to indoctrinate them, where they're trying to tell them that they can switch genders. And so here we are as women, we're trying to feed our families, we're trying to clothe our families, we're trying to get them to church. We're trying to protect them. Like we can't even put the TV on. Like what happened to Bluey? I can't even leave Bluey on the TV screen anymore. I'm having to watch it. It's like this constant, chase, right? You're on this constant chase. And I think David was exhausted. And here's our Bible hero. And a few chapters before this, he had just been anointed king. And now he finds himself in a place where he's just running and running. And I wonder if he forgot his purpose. In chapter 16, I want us to turn there. Or I can read it, actually. I'll just read it for you guys. I'm going to find it. Okay. It says that, so they sent for David. He was ready with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And David arose and went to Ramah. I love, what, I love what that says. The Lord said to Samuel, arise and anoint him. Hasn't he said that about each and every one of us here this afternoon? The Lord has said that. He has says, arise and anoint. Put your name in there. Marilee, Michelle, Audrey, Amanda, Christina, Sally. Arise, anoint her. God has said that to us. 
God has anointed us. He has selected us. He has called us. And the spirit of the Lord was powerful on David. Actually, the chapter after that is the infamous battle with Goliath. And what, what does David do? It says in chapter 17, he hears the blasphemy against God. He hears the threats of the enemy and he's trying to convince King Saul. And he tells King Saul, I'm gonna try to find it because I, this is the problem with my iPad. Here we go. And he tells King Saul, let me go fight this uncircumcised Philistine. You hear the confidence in his voice, ladies. He says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And so Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. I love it. He knew his purpose. He knew his purpose. It was to deliver. He had been anointed and nothing could stop him. No matter how tall and how big Goliath was, he knew his calling. But what happened from chapter 16, chapter 17 to now chapter 27? I propose we find the answers in the first few verses. In the first few words, actually, it says, then David said in his heart. Wow. It doesn't matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. It doesn't matter that we are committed, strong in the trenches. We always can face this danger where we say in our heart, we're under pressure like Michelle was just teaching, everything, there's sickness, there's pain. We're, we're feeling all the feels as women, we're not sleeping and we're under pressure. And it's so easy to have that conversation with our hearts, right? Instead of the Lord. You know, throughout all of First and, first and Second Samuel, I'm reading David. David's going through similar things. He's going through pretty nasty situations. But you know what it says? David asked of the Lord, should I go attack him? And in 1 Samuel 23, yes, go and save Kelia. David asks of the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? God says, yeah, go after them. You will recover them. David asks of the Lord, should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, which town should I go to? David asks of the Lord. And the Lord says, do not attack them straight on. So, the situations were just as challenging and scary, but the difference is who he asked. He asked of the Lord. And it doesn't matter how long we've walked with the Lord, this is a danger, we can never stop. I mean, we see King David crowned king, and there were moments in his life where he stopped asking of the Lord. And so here he is, and he says in his heart, I will perish someday at the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me to do than I should speedily escape the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will stop chasing me. He got tired of the chase. How many of you here have ever gotten tired of the, out of the chase? I'm lifting my hand because I get tired of the chase like every week. <laughs> and I have to get on my face and say, okay, Lord, I share this. To, with my lady studies, they're gonna hear this again. Sorry, girls. Um, this happened a while ago. I was gonna go speak somewhere. My little one deals with some chronic health issues. She had a flare up of something. Something else had happened at the church and I had to teach and I literally had no time to prepare, no time. And I was having this conversation with the Lord, like really you called me to this and you're making it impossible. Like, Throw me a bone, Lord, come on. Throw me a bone, like even like just one hour uninterrupted <laughs> without emergencies, Lord. And I'm out there, I have got, I got my hose. I'm trying to water the plants. It's very therapeutic if you're ever stressed out to go out in your garden. Actually, the theme of prayer closet, I mean, I'm not gonna judge you if you go in your closet, but it's so much better to go outside 
if I ever lose Ryan, I know he's out here in Joshua Tree somewhere. He always texts me. He'll be like, here's the marker. I left. I'm somewhere out here. <laughs> My own marker, whatever. That's his prayer spot. And, oh, side note, I love when he does that because we can be going through whatever we're going through as a church, as a family, in our marriage. If he's meeting with the Lord, it's going to be okay. We're meeting with the Lord, it's going to be okay. So I'm having this, I'm talking to the Lord. I'm going, you know, this is unfair. This is so hard. It's like, it just, it never changes. It, you know, there I was starting the church plant crying and saying, this is so hard. I want to go back home to Costa Mesa. Now I am doing this out in Bani. This is so hard. And then I'm trying to water the plant and the stinking hose. I'm like, there is no pressure. Like, what the heck? It's just like little dribble coming out, right? And I'm like, I can't water. There's not enough pressure. And I hear the Lord say, exactly. <laughs> you need the pressure, Clarissa. You need the pressure. And I, you know how it, it like does this little thing like that? I just kind of shook the hose and it popped out and it just squirted on all the plants. I'm trying to get you there, daughter. I'm trying to get you there. And the pressure is the sweet spot because you will depend on me. Whatever pressure you're going through today, I can't, I, I tried to tailor it. I was thinking, let's talk about working moms or let me talk about, you know, um, just professionals. Let me, and then I got this decision fatigue. Who am I going to address? <laughs> all women, we all go under pressure. Whatever pressure you're under today, there is a purpose for it. What's going to come out of your life is going to spray the world in such a way they won't know what hit them. It's going to be Jesus. It's going to be Jesus. It's not going to be you. I'm going to quote Michelle Randall. Endurance takes place by enduring pressure over a long period of time. Endurance takes place by enduring pressure. That was so good. You know what? Something very interesting happened to our hero in this story. It was told to David in verse 4 that Saul sought him no more. So he says in his heart, I can't handle this anymore. I'm exhausted. I'm going to go to the, Phil I'm going to go to the Philistines. I can't, I'm just like shocked in my head. I'm going, what? You fought these guys all this time and you're going to go find solace under them. He says, I'm going to, I need, I need a break. So he goes and he takes all his mighty men. They all do this organized move and they move to the Philistines. And what's interesting is that it says in the word, it worked for a season. Saul sought him no more. Let me tell you, ladies, Satan will get off your neck. He will get off your back. He will give you temporary rest when you stop engaging the enemy, when you stop the chase, when you stop being in the trenches. The enemy will present us peace offerings. So I, I can just imagine what that first day looked like for David. He woke up, stretched his arm in his tent, and was like, oh, man, I don't have to run. Breakfast in bed. Awesome. Next day, whew, this is nice. Everything's kosher. Everything's peaceful. But at what price? At what price? I think of the 600 men that were there that were following King David I wonder if they ask themselves, this doesn't seem right. We're not supposed, this, this, we're not supposed to be here. How did that tempt them? How did that, that compromise affect them? And so the same with us. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I am exhausted of serving the Lord. I am done with this church thing. I just need a break. Hey, I'm not saying sabbaticals are great. Pastor Jerry told Ryan and I one time, try to get away every three months. And just even if it's for like a day or two, just so that when you get back to church and, you, and you're serving, you're like super revved up. We try to do that. It doesn't always happen, <laughs> but it does. It's a, a break is good, but I'm talking about like legit compromise. Like, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to serve anymore. I'm exhausted. You might have a little bit more sleep. I don't guarantee that you will have peace because there are little eyes in your home that are watching. How about that unbelieving spouse that maybe you're married to? And you're like, I am done arguing with him. He, he gets on my case every time about going to church. I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. 
I remember a sister that was at our church and every event that we would have, she would have such grief. Her husband would just rail into her. Come on, do you have to go? Come on, that's extreme. Why are you going to midweek? Do you really have to? Now you're watching kids? What is this? And I remember she would tell me that it was just this conflict, you know? And um, eventually one day she was like, I'm done, I'm not gonna serve anymore. She stopped coming to church. And then pretty soon, she's like, I can do church at home, I'm okay. And the compromise took her farther and farther away from the will of the Lord. It's never peaceful. There is always a price when we compromise under pressure. Some tools that we can take, I think some steps that God has prescribed, purposes and rhythms that he's put in his word for us. I think number one is to be aware of our enemy. Here, David, he was thinking it's Saul. It, it was Saul, right? But his number one enemy was his heart. Jeremiah 17, nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I love what we learned today that, you know, you take a break one day, maybe you'll notice it when you stop getting in the word. You take a two days, your family, you know, three days, other people will notice it. The enemy never takes a break. Just like it says in our word that Saul pursued David every single day, we have enemies that are real, ladies. The flesh, our own flesh, it doesn't stop. The world, all of that that's raining on us from the outside and the enemy of our souls, Satan. I love what A.W. Tozer says. He says, the terror of warning is in my soul soul to think about it god forbid as i get older in my christian life that i should settle down to live in some area in my life which god has possessed but now satan has overcome and i have no desire to drive him out our walk is a progressive one so we get to one stage and then the lord reveals something else to us right and then we're like oh I thought I was good. <laughs> then he reveals something else. Oh, I thought I was good. But he's slowly changing us day by day. So being aware of your enemy is number one. Number two, serving the Lord is a very safe place to be. Engaging, engaging in ministry with our work, in our workplaces, with our family. Um, Breaks are good, but not for a long time. First John 1 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I'm going to read this a few times. Just, it takes me a while sometimes. If we walk in the light, this isn't, I walked in the light last year when I would bring my unbelieving kids to church and I was serving. No, no, no. This wasn't, when I was young, I walked in the light. This isn't, when I was single, I walked in the light, but now I don't walk in the light. No, this is present tense. If we walk in the light, what is the connection to that? It connects to, we have fellowship with one another. So walking in the light means you're gonna have fellowship with the body of Christ. It's a safe place to be. It's a place of accountability. It's a place of sanctification. It purifies us. There's something like no other thing like serving in the body of Christ where you're paired with people that you're like, I have nothing in common with this person. We see things completely different, but then the Lord, he uses that stuff to, to grind at us to reveal things that are in our flesh that need to die, to make us love the body of Christ. I remember when we first started the church and I was like, oh man, Lord, there's only 50 people here. Like, this is hard. <laughs> Ryan would make me get up on the guitar and say, all right, you gotta start. I'm like, there's like three people in the front row. Can we please wait till more people walk in? <laughs> He'd be like, nope, start on time. 
But there's, there is something about these spiritual lessons that we learn when we gather together. That's why the enemy wants to keep us apart, right? He's tried everything. We've seen it here in California. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another. Ephesians 6, 8, render service with a good will as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. Galatians 5, 13, for you were called to freedom, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If David had been thinking about one another, he would have never led his men to, to Ziklag, to the place of the flesh. And thirdly and lastly, what can we do when we're under pressure is be diligent about our courage. Spurgeon said, be diligent concerning your courage. Pray that the Lord will strengthen you. I can't tell you how many times I, something will happen, something's going on in the ministry, and I'm just like, I can't take this anymore, Lord. And my husband's like, you just need to go read the word again and have your cup of tea and your guitar. And it's, it's true. Like, you get to that place with the Lord. You cultivate the courage, and you're like, I'm okay. I remember my purpose. I remember who I am in Christ. So we need to do that daily. Chronicles 16, 11 says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Have you ever lost anything? And I don't know, there's two types of people. There's the ones that are like, oh, I lost it, I'll eventually find it. And then there's the neurotic ones like me that tear the whole house apart. I can't go to bed. I have to look through every drawer and then I still can't find it. And then it comes, I find it like in the most crazy time. That's, seek the Lord like that. Seek the Lord like that, not just once. Sometimes I have women that come to me and they say, I don't know, but like the, my anxiety, it's still there. It's, I'm like, good, okay. So what happened after the anxiety came? Well, I went to work and this and that. I'm like, okay, so that's the time you get the word again. You, I, you write it on your hand. Write it on your folder. I work with Carissa. Where's Carissa? We work, at, we work in the courthouse sometimes together. I get, I get blessed once in a while. I get to see her. And, and there's days where I'm just like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, what was that that you told me? And I'll write it on my little notebook thing. And I'm just walking around looking at it all day long. Because I have to see it. I have to dwell on it. I have to, I have to ask the Lord, help me own this today. So the good news, ladies, in closing, is the end of the story is the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The Lord loves David. The Lord loves me and you. And he ends up, in verse 29, doing what David couldn't do for himself. This snare was broken. It says in the word that God's purpose for him was to be king of Israel. And even though David was in Ziklag, even though he was in a place of compromise, you know what happened? The king wanted to take David to war, to fight against all of his people. Imagine David, like, I got to go to war. I'm going to kill Uncle Jimmy over there. I'm going to kill, like, he's going to know all these people. He was going to have to go kill them. I can imagine the internal conflict of David. Have you ever been in a place like that where you're just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The Lord came to his rescue and made it so that the war chiefs that were under the king said, oh, no, no, this guy's going to turn on us. You're crazy. Send him back. And so the king of the Philistines is like, oh, man, I really like you, but, you know, I can't. I've been outvoted. You got to go back. So David was delivered. The Lord is so faithful. Whatever his purpose is for you, he is going to complete it. Whatever his calling is upon your life, he is going to complete it. We could write a story about each of you and where the Lord has anointed you, where he has called you, and what it's going to look like. I hope that in heaven we have all these fun books that we could read all about each other. Maybe they'll be like, I envision it as, okay, like almost Narnia-esque. Like we'll close our eyes and God will like bring us through this warp tunnel and we could watch everybody's life and how God did all these amazing miracles like in three minutes. Because time's going to be different in heaven. But those will be like quick, quick flicks of God's faithfulness, right? <laughs> So in closing, 
I just want to encourage you ladies with this last verse. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he gives aid to the seed of Abraham. I was thinking, who should I ask for a prayer? I think all of us face pressure. So if you don't mind bowing your heads, I would be honored to pray for each and every one of you this, this afternoon. Father, I just thank you so much for each and every woman that is here. Thank you so much that though our outward man is perishing, our inward is being renewed day by day. Thank you, Father, that what the enemy might be intending in our life to break us. Lord, we're in your jurisdiction. And so each woman that's here, each young girl that's here, wherever they're at in their walk with the Lord, may you remind them that you have provisions from heaven and route to equip them for whatever they are facing today. Thank you for this time of getting really rooted and grounded in your word. We love you, Jesus. We bless your name in this place. Amen. Amen.